Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. My name is Bill Harmer, the Executive Director of the Westport Library. We are thrilled to be partnering with Team Westport to welcome Yale University Professor and MacArthur Foundation Fellow, Jennifer Richardson, as the inaugural speaker for a new program series centered on the issues of racial justice. The next program in our series will take place on Tuesday, December 1st, and will feature Westport native and CBS News correspondent, Jeff Pegues, as he sits down with Major League Baseball Hall of Famer, Dave Winfield, Los Angeles Sparks forward Candace Parker, and former NBA star Charles Smith to discuss how George Floyd's death sparked a social justice movement in sports. Please mark your calendars and continue to be a part of these critical conversations. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Harold and Bernstein Bailey. Harold will be introducing Professor Richardson in just a moment, and Bernstein will be monitoring the Q&A later in the program. Harold and Bernstein are committed to civic duty and philanthropy through their leadership roles with Team Westport, Westport's official committee focused on achieving, celebrating, and extending diversity with respect to racial, ethnic, religious, and LGBTQ issues in our community. Harold? Thanks, Bill. Professor Jennifer A. Richardson is Yale University's Philip R. Allen Professor of Psychology. Her work concerns the ways in which sociocultural group memberships, such as race, gender, and socioeconomic status, impact the ways that people think, feel, behave, and especially during interactions with members of different sociocultural groups. Her current research is largely focused on dynamics and consequences of increasing racial, ethnic, and other forms of cultural diversity most notably the rising racial ethnic diversity of this nation. Her work has been published in various scholarly journals as well as popular publications such as The Atlantic, The Economist, and The New York Times. In 2009, she received the Distinguished Scientific Award for Early Career Contributions to Psychology from the American Psychological Association. In 2015, she was also elected to the National Academy of Sciences. In addition, she's been named both the MacArthur and Guggenheim Fellow. And last but not least, she's a graduate of Bernstein and, and my alma mater, Brown University, from which she was recently awarded an honorary degree. As one of the nation's foremost researchers and spokespersons on the science surrounding race perceptions attitudes and interactions. We could not ask for a more important speaker than Dr. Richardson to address our community at this pivotal point uh, in our nation's history. Through decades of work for which she's garnered both MacArthur and Guggenheim fellowships, as was mentioned before, as well as the recognition of her peers as a global leader in this arena, Dr. Richardson has lent clarity and reality to elements of race previously steeped in ambiguity and perception. Team Westport is honored to have her launch our series surrounding racial justice in partnership with the Westport Library. Tonight, she will be speaking on the mythology of racial progress. Dr. Richardson. Thank you so much. What an incredibly kind uh, introduction. And it is my absolute pleasure and honor to be with you, to be the inaugural speaker. Wow. Um, and more importantly, I just want to congratulate all of you on this series. It's so important. Um, and these are the very conversations we need to be um, having to move our society forward. I'm just going to share my screen um, so we can all be on the same page. Um, are, are you? Seeing that, okay, great. So today I'm going to hopefully just begin by just kick off a conversation about uh, where we are and hopefully shed some light on the psychology that governs sometimes where we think we are, which is wildly divorced from where we actually are in terms of racial progress. But I wanna start with this example um, of, um, the father of a dear friend of mine, his name is Bob Smith, um, who in the wake of the George Floyd uh, murder by the Minneapolis Police uh, Department, 
you know, staged a one man protest uh, in his re returned home in Mississippi. He spent much of his uh, adult years in Boston to, you know, really to, just to stand for racial justice, uh, equal access, as you can as you can see his sign uh, says, and you know, to the promise of this nation. And I think it's important to note that this was not Mr. Smith's first protest. He was one of the, the very people who was uh, beaten uh, on Bloody Sunday with um, Congressman Lewis, uh, recently Department of Congressman Lewis, um, and has been part of racial justice efforts all of his adult life and including his teen years. As this event gained uh, prominence, often on um, social media, social media, so of Mr. Smith's protest in, in Mississippi, people started to question how much has changed, if anything, since 1965, since the 1960s. And I think this very question really gets to the heart of something that I've been working on, which is the mythology of racial progress or our national narrative of racial progress. And it goes something like this, right? We're led to believe as citizens of this country, people who are certainly committed and devoted to this country, that our story of race sounds something like this, right? There was this time in the past. Sometimes we talk about it as, an, as during slavery, sometimes during civil rights, but where we weren't doing so well as a nation in terms of our racial equality. Okay, so we sort of low, if you, you know, deal with graphs, as I often do, low levels of racial equality in the past, but, you know, we're making steady progress toward more equality, and there's, and there are these inflection points, right, that advance our progress. So, for instance, the March on Washington, the, the groundbreaking legislation of the 60s, right? but maybe also the election of Barack Obama as the first black president of the United States. We see these as markers of change that you know, radically increase the rate at which we were getting towards that racial equality that we so um, desire. But more importantly, that this progress, this change, this increasing uh, ever forward movement to racial equality is happening one, only in that direction getting more and more of it and over time. And it's you know almost inevitable, right? It's who we are, which means it's who we will become you know, fairly soon. Okay. So I want to argue that it's important for us to you know, understand that this narrative is largely part of our mythology, meaning there's some truth to it and there are certainly some evidence to it. We, ha we have come an incredibly long way. We are no longer a nation that enslaves its, you know, members of people who weren't citizens. Uh, other people, right, we don't do that. The landmark legislation of the 60s did dramatically change the opportunities of people of color in this nation, but this is not something that's inevitable and it's not something that's happening only linearly, meaning in one direction, there are setbacks and it's certainly not preordained. Okay? So I think it's important to really disrupt this narrative, you know, really contest this mythology for a few reasons. Uh, at least I'm gonna to argue today and we can discuss it um, in the Q&A. And one is that our perceptions of racial equality are affected by belief in this narrative, right? The extent to which we perceive or perhaps acknowledge the racial equality that's still in our society, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, that is in part uh, affected by the extent to which we buy into this mythology of racial progress. And of course, if we are not perceiving the actual racial equality or inequality that exists, we are going to not be interested in enacting any interventions to bring about you know, the equality that we so desire, right? We need to accurately assess the amount of racial equality in our environments, in our communities. Of course, we need to diagnose its sources, its roots, but we need both of those in order to usher in any type of change to do something about it, okay? So, I'm gonna argue that this mythology largely keeps us sort of willfully blind a, a bit to the actual racial equality uh, around us. And today I'm gonna to spend a little bit of time uh, demonstrating this 
in the domain of racial economic equality, okay? So this is a uh, work I've been doing uh, in collaboration with uh, my graduate students, of course, but also uh, uh, faculty member Michael Krauss, who's a assistant professor uh, at the Yale School of Management. And we did something very simple. We just asked people questions of this sort, right? And feel free to uh, generate your own answer. So take a stab at this. For every $100 of wealth accumulated by the average white family, in today, right? Let's just think today. How much wealth has the average Black family accumulated? Okay, so we asked a sample, a national representative sample of Americans this very question. And we asked them to make their estimates for today. And at the time, today was 2016, <laughs> right? And we, you know, made it clear that they were supposed to do it on this scale from zero to 200, where 100 is exact equality. Right? Black families and white families have the same amount of wealth in the United States. Right? If you believe that, you should select 100. Right? If you believe that black families have less wealth than white families, then you should select something between zero and 100. And if you believe that the average black family has more wealth than the average white family, you should select something between 100 and 200. Okay? So we asked participants to do this for the year 2016, and then another 11 time points starting in 1960 three uh, across to 2016, okay? People made their estimates, right, one at a time in a random order. And what we wanted to ascertain was how accurate people are, okay? But also what people believed, okay? So just these two things. So here, just to orient you to this graph, right, on the y-axis, we have the estimates that participants made, right? What's the percent of wealth the average Black family has, you know, if the average white family has $100, right? So what proportion of 100 does the average Black family have? And then, of course, along the x-axis are the time points we asked about or close to, okay? So what did we find? Okay, and these are on average. So this yellow line is, you know, are the points that people responded, right? So what you can see is in 1963, respondents thought on average, right, black families about had about half the wealth of white families, or the average black family has about half the wealth of the average white family. And you can see that across time, participants think that this gap is narrowing, right? What by 2016, people think that the average black family has about 90% the wealth of the average white family, right? This steady linear perception or assumption of racial progress in racial wealth um, equality across time. Okay, the orange dots in line are reality during this same time period. Right? So in reality, in 1963, the average Black family had about $5 for every $100 the average White family had, right? 1 20th of the wealth. And that has barely budged across time to 2016. Okay, there have been some fluctuations, of course, right? So today, the average Black family has about, well, in 2016, the average Black family had about 10% of the wealth of the average white family, right? So some increase, right? But we expect that actually to go back down uh, given COVID and the effects that have been disproportionately borne by, uh, by folks of color, okay? So, what, so, so some things to note here, right? People were very bad, I mean, wrong, <laughs> inaccurate uh, about 1963 on average, okay? But they were far more inaccurate about 2016. And the nature of the inaccuracy is of course, both because the actual reality of the racial wealth gap, at least the black white wealth gap across these years, these decades is flat, right? So if you believe that there has been upward linear progress, on this marker of equality, you know, or in general, then you can only get more inaccurate. You can only get more wrong given the reality, okay? And we have some evidence to suggest that when you ask about perceptions of racial equality or inequality across time like this, because people believe so much in the racial progress narrative, they get more and more wrong when you ask about it this way compared to when you just ask people, you know, what do you think the racial wealth gap is right now, right? 
you just ask that one question, people are still wrong, right? <laughs> you know, but they're less wrong. Okay. So two points here. One, um, it's important to recognize that this, this, these results that we've replicated many times now suggest that on average, Americans falsely believe we've achieved considerable more racial um, equality than we than is than we actually have. Okay. It's true for other markers of economic equality as well, but wealth is the one on which people are, are the least well-informed, okay? And it, this appears to be governed by this mythology of racial progress. So you might be asking, you know, because I just said it's a, it's a, that was a nationally representative sample of American adults. Do some people or some types of people overestimate racial economic equality more than others? Are some people more accurate than others, okay? And of course, yes, that is true in systematic ways and ways you might have expected. Uh, white Americans on average are uh, overestimate more, they believe that there's more equality than actually exists. They do that more than do racial minority Americans, okay? High income Americans do this more than middle and lower income Americans. And of course, you know, and so here, just to sort of um, demonstrate this a little bit more with, with data, I do enjoy my data, right? So these are uh, um, data on different sample of participants, um, uh, both here, here we had sampled high and, and lower income white and black Americans. Okay. And now the, the graph is oh, still overestimates. So how much people are overestimating racial economic equality. And this is a composite of different markers. So income, wealth, uh, wages, right? So, you know, it's a, it's a, a little bit more robust, but also um, sort of mixing different types of economic markers, okay? But for each one, we're still comparing what people say to statistics from the government. I should have said that earlier. How do we know what reality is? Well, it turns out our government, yay, thankfully, um, as well as others, but the government uh, asks about these things and they can they assess these things so we can get stable uh, estimates of the reality of wealth gaps and any number of other markers from the, you know, from the, from the government, federal statistics, statistics, okay? So here are overestimates of current, uh, so 2016, racial economic inequality, again, with those, that composite measure, right, the overestimates compared to national data. And what you see is, again, high income white Americans are overestimating more than their low income counterparts. Um, and interestingly, um, actually high income um, uh, black Americans are also doing this, but to a smaller extent, okay? So you can also, you can also see the race difference. Uh, high income white Americans are doing this more than uh, everyone else, okay? So why? Right? We see these patterns and we replicate this many times as well. Why might this be the case? Right? Well, we know that who you are is often a marker of where you live. Okay? Our nation still is incredibly segregated both by race and by socioeconomic status. So higher income white Americans are the most likely to live in racially and economically segregated spaces on the high end and low income African Americans uh, are especially likely to, to live in racially and economically segregated spaces on the low end, right? But this means that we are largely not coming into contact with one another, um, certainly members of those groups and it, it affords differences in the type of exposure we have to how other people live and how um, their lives may be affected by uh, racial inequality and, of course, economic um, misfortune. All right. So it's important to think about, you know, what we have access to. You know, in fact, this project was inspired in part because when I moved to Yale from Northwestern, you know, not that there's not inequality uh, at in Evanston where Northwestern is, but I think we get used to, we get, you know, habituated to what is around us. When I moved to Yale, to Hamden, it's where I live, hey, from up the street, I should have said that earlier. <laughs> um, I wasn't used to the racial or, or economic inequality of this place and it really stood out to me, right? It was so obvious. And that is a reminder that when we move into unfamiliar spaces, different things become apparent to us. You know, they smack us in the face, right? You know, but it wasn't like they weren't there before. We just are now, you know, getting to see it. 
So both what we have access to affects what we know, right? But also we're motivated to believe in, you know, in, in, well, in many things, but certainly in racial equality, especially today, right? That's part of the mythology. We, we want to believe this with part of our narrative because it helps us provide meaning, All right? So I talk about a couple of the ways that uh, the cognition works, but also the motivation. So imagine, let's go back to this question for every $100 of wealth accumulated by the average white family, how much wealth has the average black family accumulated? When you approach this question for some people, and we, we know wh what black person comes to mind is dependent on kind of what you wanna believe. So if you're wanting to believe that racial equal equality has largely been achieved, the person that you bring to mind is Oprah or um, LeBron James or Serena Williams, somebody who is very high profile, but also high income and they're highly salient, right? Rather than the more, you know, typical maybe black family that you may, depending on who you are, not actually have any access to, may not see from day to day, right? May not come to mind, okay? So that's part of the dynamic that seems to enter into this. And then of course, even you know upper middle-class black Americans do have access to both high income white Americans, but also usually through family networks, lower income black Americans, and so one reason why they're more accurate is because they do get to see how race and socioeconomic status uh, maybe constrain opportunities and outcomes, or at least how people uh, of different walks of life live, right? So that is also true for many uh, poorer white Americans, right? They're more likely to have uh, contact across race lines and, and contact with people who are of the same socioeconomic strata. So that's uh, one of the cognitive mechanisms. Um, what's uh, motivated is also, again, the, our fierce commitment to the American dream, right? This is such an important and foundational narrative, right? And its coexistence with the racial uh, progress narrative is really important, right? We fundamentally believe, you know, America is about, in fact, working hard, you know, and giving it your all and your talents uh, will be rewarded. Okay, that's what we believe. And that is what this country is meant to be about. All right. That's been more true at some times in our history than at others. Okay, that, but largely, especially compared to caste-based cultures, right, feudal cultures, <laughs> That is more true in this society than in many others, right? It's not even possible to get ahead if you're certain from certain walks of life in certain countries, okay? That is not true in the United States. So, you know, why is this a, a problem? Well, it's not except for when the belief in the ideal of the American dream is overriding evidence to the contrary where there, you know, that suggests that there are, um, uh, opportunities are not distributed equally, that there are structural barriers for some members of society more than others, right? Not at the level perhaps of individuals, but at the group level, okay? And that's when we, you know, get in trouble. So for instance, you can measure um, sort of an overbelief in the American dream or in our, in psychology, we call it belief in a just world um, where with, you know, very straightforward questions like, I believe that by and large people get what they deserve, right? I am confident that justice always prevails over injustice, right? I firmly believe that injustices in all areas of life are the exception rather than the rule. So there's nothing bad or wrong about these items or about these beliefs. And certainly this is our ideal. The problem is that it, it especially when you're thinking about you know, racial inequality in our nation's history, they sort of seduce us into believing that, you know, there was never discrimination. There was never uh, slavery or Jim Crow, right? The discrimination still is not changing the opportunities for some more than others. So, and so then not surprisingly, what you find when you ask people to, you know, endorse these beliefs or how much they endorse these beliefs, okay? And then you also ask them about their perceptions of racial economic equality, right? So that's what's on the y-axis here, um, estimates, right, of uh, current racial equality. 
what you find is that both Black Americans and white Americans, to the same degree, the more you believe that the world, the country, the nation is basically a just place, meaning the less you believe in racial inequality, right? And, and actually socioeconomic inequality, meaning structural inequalities, the more you overestimate racial economic inequality, right? The more you think that the racial groups, Blacks and whites, have the, about the same amount of wealth, income, wages today, okay? And so the more wrong you are. Okay. So again, it's not, um, none of these beliefs are inherently a problem. The problem is that they keep us blind to the actual inequality that exists in our nation. The last uh, bit of this that I want to feature is this belief in the racial progress narrative um, altogether, right? Again, I, I, there's one, it's one thing to say that this is just a general belief. We have a narrative that we believe in, but um, you know, it's just kind of operating in the background and it doesn't really have any um, effects on, on, on how we think about inequality, okay? Uh, if only that were true, right? This uh, belief, we're, we have a strong fidelity to it. And more importantly, the uh, a real commitment to the idea that today is decidedly more equal than in the past on every, on any marker you can think of, right? And that it's continuing to, to get there. But let me just deal with the, the today is more equal than the past, All right? So if today is largely equal, right, as many people believe, right, racial wealth gap is closed, then you don't need to really intervene either locally or with federal intervention to do anything about it, right? You don't need to worry about uh, the segregation, for instance, unequal access to quality health care, to schools, right? It's everything's equal. So whatever outcomes currently exist that are unequal, there must be something uh, wrong with the people themselves. <laughs> they must have just not accessed the opportunities that they had. Okay, that's what you have to uh, believe. Okay. So one way to uh, to to deal with this sort of misperception of reality is to try to disrupt this narrative. Right? And that's something that we have recently begun to do. And in some ways, our research, you know, mirroring what's happening in the world, right? Post George Floyd, this summer of protest began to disrupt this narrative of racial progress. And what we wanted to know was, oh, okay, if with more and more people thinking about systemic racism, thinking about the ways in which society is not arranged equally, depending on who you are, maybe that will lead people to have more accurate um, perceptions of the current state of racial economic inequality. So to test this, again, a new study, new sample of white American participants, uh, we, we randomly assign them, uh, this is sort of a experimental sort of backdrop <laughs> to uh, either read about racism in society, right? Especially the ways in which things are quite similar to what they were in the 1960s, right? They might look a little differently. They might be due to differences, right? There's no more legal um, laws of this segregation, um, but we see that neighborhoods and schools are still segregated, right? So we you know, have them read a, a paragraph, all veridical information, okay? About the current state of sort of racism in society, or they read something that's, that's unrelated, a control article. And after we have them do this same exercise just for 1963 and 2016, right? And the argument is if we remind people or inform them that actually racial inequality, um, race, racism, racial discrimination is still part of our society, it's still part of contemporary society, it's still affecting the opportunities and outcomes of people of color in this country, right? And it has been for the past several decades right, that will disrupt this narrative of racial progress, right? And we should be able to see that in the amount of racial wealth equality people estimate from 1963 to today, okay? So did we, were we, were we able to disrupt this progress narrative, okay? So 
this graph on the y-axis are overestimates of that progress, right? So we really just looked at what people estimated in 2016 and estimated for uh, 1963 to, well, looked how accurate they were and then took a difference, right? So these are literally just estimates of progress, okay? So higher numbers mean they were, uh, well, mean that they thought there was more progress um, toward racial economic equality, okay? and more than there actually has been, okay? So these are overestimates. And what you can see is those who read about racism, right, the consistent racism in the United States did estimate less progress, right? They were more accurate about how much progress towards racial economic equality, racial wealth equality actually had been achieved in society from 1963 to 2016. Okay, so good. All right, we disrupted the narrative. It seems to have some effect on people's perceptions of racial economic uh, equality. Okay, but the question is, how did it affect these estimates? Did perceptions of the current racial wealth gap, which are so wildly inaccurate, become more accurate? The answer is no. People held fast to their overestimates of the, the amount of equality that there currently is between the wealth that black and white families currently have. Okay, no differences between those in the control condition and those who read about racism, right? Pretty disappointing, <laughs> especially given, you know, this is a, a somewhat of assimilation of what we've all just been through uh, this summer. So what do people do? How can we reconcile the fact that people acknowledge that there's been less progress, but think that today is just as, you know, people are equal today, largely equal in wealth today. Well, what happened is, and you know, in some ways this is why psychology is so exciting, but also so maddening, is people change their perception of the past, right? They said, oh, okay, well, if, there's been less progress, but today I know it's pretty equal. That must mean that the past, the 1960s, weren't as bad as I thought, <laughs> right? So they up their estimates of how equal the races were, blacks and whites, in wealth in 1963. They reason that, oh, if there hasn't been that much progress, that means the 1960s weren't as bad as I thought. Not that today is worse than I think, okay? Not exactly gonna lead us to uh, interventions to create more equitable current outcomes. So disrupting the narrative is not enough, right? The study shows us that we, our commitment, our belief in the narrative is strong, our commitment to believing that society today is, is fair and just, it's just incredibly powerful, incredibly strong, and we have to do more than disrupt the narrative that we've made uh, less progress than we think, that systemic racism still exists, right? That's not enough. So of course, we're currently trying to think through, well, what should we be doing? What can we be doing? So, you know, stay tuned or, or have me back. <laughs> but we certainly, one thing is clear, we need to live in reality not the mythology, right? We need to select reality over the mythology. And our work and now others have shown that this is very hard for us as Americans. We do not enjoy doing this, especially something around racial inequality, which really um, disrupts our sense of moral goodness and rightness as a nation, right? We much rather believe that we've come so far. We've almost fixed it just a little tweaks here around the edges might be fine at, at most, right? That's not our reality, right? This is our reality. There is a vast wealth gap. It is driven or has been driven by legal uh, racist forms of racism, including legal segregation, including red line, red line, including disproportionate evictions and exclusion in any number of domains of life, right? all of these things that are, have occurred in the past, starting in slavery, but not ending there, and are continuing to afford some more opportunity than others. And these are racially patterned, right? There's just no getting around it. 
and wealth is a strong marker of this because it is intergenerational, because it compounds, right? So it is so susceptible to things that happened in the past, right? It's going to build on it on itself. So what happened in the past leads to what we see today, where we have these segregated spaces and in part because of the way school funding happens through property taxes, you see that on average, white school districts, school districts in disproportionately white neighborhoods have billions of dollars more in funding than non-white school districts, right? So compounding the effects, disrupting opportunities, by race. You don't need any laws to do this, right? At least not any racially exclusionary laws to do this. Everything's set up to do this operating on its own, All right? So let me go back to this map that I showed earlier of New Haven, I'm gonna blow it up. And yes, in, this was a map of segregation <laughs> in some forms, but it's also a map of redlining, right? It's a map of real estate corporations and lenders deciding which areas are ripe for investment and financing and which are not so good. And you can sort of see the color coding, red is bad, green is good. And of course that overlaps with where black and white Americans um, and others now live. And this is from 1937, right? You can find this kind of map for almost any major metropolis. The, these, um, this redlining, these relationships, these arrangements have baked in differences in opportunity that we're now seeing, still seeing, seeing the costs of, the outcomes of, the consequences of, right? And we cannot turn a blind eye to it. And we can't say, oh, that was just in the past. It has no effects on the future or our present. It does, okay? For instance, this is beautiful work by the economist Ross Jetty at Harvard. You know, if you have an opportunity to go to his Opportunity Insights uh, uh, website, I highly recommend it, but just demonstrates that even if we look at income differences, right, you see that uh, people, black and white boys raised in higher income, in this case wealth uh, families, still have disparate outcomes, right? And they uh, summed it up nicely here. I'll just blow it up where they say white boys who grow up rich are likely to stay that way, right? Opportunities shaping their lives in ways that are predestined. Black boys raised in similarly wealthy households are more likely to fall to the bottom than stay at the top. And it's the equal likely of, of good outcomes, right? Economic outcomes as black boys who grow up in almost any level of wealth except for the lowest tier, okay? Right, this is race trumping income and wealth. This is racism, systemic racism, trumping the, what we like to think you know, of, of economic opportunities in our society. So just to close up, <laughs> I wanna you know, really make a plug here for as Sherilyn Eiffel, the um, head of the National um, uh, NAACP Legal Defense Fund, argument that we need and have needed for some time truly transformative change to intervene on the processes that are giving these, are leading to these outcomes, okay? And I wanna argue that our mythology about racial progress is undermining our willingness to take these bold steps for intervention, right? We do know that the arc of the moral universe is long but it bends towards justice. Yes, we believe that. But more importantly, we, we believe and know that it's bending towards justice because people are bending it. <laughs> there are also people bending it the other way or trying to, right? So we owe it to ourselves and to Bob Smith and to anybody who really truly fundamentally believes in, in racial justice to be part of the benders, those bending that moral arc. And I thoroughly believe that these types of events are part of that bending the arc and are, are gonna get us closer to that outcome. Thank you all so much for listening. Here's lots of ways to get in touch with me <laughs> uh, after this, but I really appreciate um, everyone coming. I'm looking forward to the conversation.
Well, good evening. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Richardson, for um, can't you hear me? Professor Richardson for that wonderful talk. Um, I want to remind everyone that for Q and A, we are getting questions in uh, the bottom of the Q in the Q and A session section of your screen. So we have about twenty minutes, and um, our just so excited. It's so wonderful to have you here with us. I'll start out. Um, your work is so fascinating. Just wondering, I know you said you moved to New Haven and, uh, you know, to this area, and then it just kind of hit you in the face. Is that really what galvanized you to start doing this type of work? Yes, certainly, certainly this work on racial economic inequality. Yes, I did not start until I moved here in 2016. Now, granted, that was coincident with the um, election of Donald Trump. Um, but it um, it was, I mean, if you've been to New Haven, uh, you know, the, and honestly, in Connecticut, the, um, the, the sort of racial and economic patterning of Connecticut is really, um, it stands out in ways that was less true, were less true in Evanston, certainly true in Chicago. So, you know, ride the, the, the L, you also notice it. But I think we all get used to, we habituate to the inequality we see every day, um, in part because maybe we don't see it, just our, you know, our roots to work and, and you're back. Now we don't leave the house, so we don't see it. <laughs> But I do think there's something about being in a different space. Um, and it just, it really smacks you in the face. And New Haven, of course, with Yale and all this wealth right in the center of it, um, it just jumps out in ways that I think are, are, are undeniable. So that's, you know, got me re interested in especially economic inequality. And then I kept telling people about the racial wealth gap, you know, the, the magnitude of it, and they kept not believing me. And these were, you know, really smart, <laughs> educated people. And they, I would just tell someone like, no, that can't be true, Jen. And so I said, well, I just, just, or do people just not know this? And so then we started doing the studies to say, oh yeah, no, people just don't know this. Wow. <laughs> Okay, so do you, do you think it's getting across finally? I know it's, it's slow. I mean, we do make progress when we go back, but um, all in all. You know, I, I'm, I think more people believe um, certainly in, that systemic racism is a thing. Yeah. I, 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 there is a block around wealth in part because I think a lot of people don't know what wealth is. Um, but I think also because it is so wide the actual wealth gap, that black white wealth gap, that people, it's, it's, it's so confronting that all of our normal um, ways of justifying it, oh, well, maybe those people don't work hard, or maybe, you know, um, it's just bad luck. <laughs> they are insufficient explanations for such a big gap. And I think that is so, um, so uncomfortable that the only thing that's left is to deny it. But I, so, I, mean, I do think it's psychologically confronting because even when we publish this work, you know, every time a new paper comes out or other people, Raj Chetty's group, um, Sandy Darity's group, so economists who actually publish the data on this, we just look at perceptions of it. But, you know, every time any one of us has a paper on this, there is just a slew of backlash, like that can't be true. And it's like, but it is. <laughs> OK, well, we have. Um some questions from our audience. Thank you so much. What are your thoughts on some ways we can truly disrupt the racial progress mythology? Wow, yeah, I mean, I think we need to own up to it as, as, as a mythology um, and not a reality. I think we need to catch ourselves and others um, entertaining it, right? I, I think almost whenever we find out about some, um, you know, counterexample, right, of backlash to, uh, you know, racial progress, we explain it away, right? We smooth over it, right? Whenever we encounter some evidence of progress, Barack Obama getting elected, we immediately embrace it and actually say, okay, great, we're finally post-racial. Right, we we want it. We want that to be so true. Again, this is the motivated cognition of it that we just seduce ourselves 
Um, and then there are any number of other ways. You might have, uh, some of you have caught yourself doing this where you see, you know, young kids, right? There's always some cute commercial or Facebook post about young kids of some one black, one white embracing. <laughs> and we immediately go to, oh yes, yeah, see the children, they will fix it for us. They don't, you know, they don't come with this baggage. And that is true. They do not come with this baggage. We teach it to them. It turns out though, the process of socialization in this country, they turn into us. <laughs> They're not gonna fix it for us. If we wanna fix it, we need to be the people to fix it, to intervene. So one, making that commitment, not delaying to some time in the future, right? The time narrative is so seductive, right? Especially the, when the old people die off and the young kids replace them, we'll be fine. One, that's not true. That's just not true. But you know now that is not true. One, there are people like Bob Smith who are 75 and my parents who are still fighting for racial justice. And it's a disservice to them to suggest that <laughs> we need to wait for them to pass on. Two, we, we know that children turn into middle-aged adults at some point and they look just like current middle-aged adults. And, and so we that's also um, wrong on the merits. And two, again, how many people have to be denied opportunity while we wait for these young kids to grow up and to control things. Like surely that can't be a satisfactory answer, right? If we fundamentally believe that this country is meant to be one in which there is equality of opportunity. Okay, <laughs> one of our comments is, and go Bob Smith. So that, that's- Yes. <laughs> but um, I know you're talking about Connecticut and how kind of a different world in a way because of the, you know, the rich towns and the big cities and, and how we don't interact. One of the questions is, and I'll state it in full, in a town like Westport, I have had a very difficult time getting residents here to join me in going to Bridgeport. Whether we are talking about entertainment events or for charitable efforts, I can easily get people to write checks or bring me clothes and things to bring to people there, but not to accompany me, or just to come in and enjoy dinner there. How can we create structural opportunities to desegregate our towns and bring more interaction between our two wonderful towns? Yeah, wow. One, good for you for trying. That is, that is impressive um, and important. And, you know, I, I will, you know, go, I, I will say two things about it. One, <laughs> going back to what I said about the kids won't fix it for us. Um, they won't, but they especially won't if we continue to um, believe it's fine for them to live in, socialize in, and attend segregated schools, right? And we have basically as a society divested from integration. Yes, we all believe that, that legal segregation is bad and wrong, <laughs> but de facto segregation or not even even worse than that, segregating ourselves along racial and social economic, economic lines, we've selected into that. And we select into that every day, knowingly or not, or willing to acknowledge it or not, <laughs> that's what we're doing. So step one is, you know, personally committing to not doing that. It's hard. It comes at a cost, right? At the, the, the I, you know, I'm not popular in my department when someone, who, a new faculty member, comes and they have the conversation about, oh, well, where are you going to live, or where are you choosing to live, and they say, oh, in Guilford, you know, the schools. <laughs> That's not wrong. It also means you're choosing a segregated life for your white children, right? <laughs> yeah, or the bridge, or whatever it is, right? And and again, until we commit to this racial patterning no longer being a thing, right? Until we commit to reducing it, so through changing the the rules of, about property taxes, funding schools, um, changing the funding models, making sure kids have high quality education irrespective of their zip code, right? That is what, one, changes their life circumstances, whether it's integrated or not, but it also breaks down the barriers to integration because people don't feel like they're um, sacrificing opportunities for their children, which of course, nobody wants to suggest anyone do. Correct, thank <laughs> you. Here's another one um, in reference to something that a comment that was just made recently in, in the news. We may have a number of Jared Kushners in our town, 
that believe that people of color simply need to want to succeed in, in order to succeed. What would you say in response to that? Well, Jared, <laughs> no, I mean, again, I, um, you know, that's just so wrong headed and not that there aren't some people who don't want to succeed, whatever that means. It cer certainly don't prioritize um, economic success or maximizing their economic outcomes. I mean, I'm one of them, right? No one goes into academia to, be, to get rich, that's for sure. <laughs> but, sh you know, the extent to which you, you know, you start to believe that that is more true of some racial groups than others is just wrong headed. And it's, uh, and sadly, it's racist. I mean, it's, it's just, and it's not true, right? I mean, you know, I, um, uh, one, you know, I, my family is, you know, been here a long time. We are the descendants of American slaves, right? We have um, made incredible, um, you know, strides both on both sides at different, you know, times. My father's family, right? So, you know, my grand, my father's father, so my grandfather's grandfather was a slave in Virginia, right? My grandfather uh, and, and his wife, my grandmother, had a third and fifth grade education because they had to work in Virginia, right? Two generations later, all of my brother and I, obviously, we both went to Brown. <laughs> We've done well. We, I mean, we're success stories. We're doing well, right? It's not magic, right? Our families wanted us to succeed. In fact, my grandparents, all of my dad's parents, they, they all worked hard. They worked hard and their kids, my dad, each one of his siblings worked hard to send money home so each of his siblings could go to college. Right, that is part of the Black American narrative. It's not just an immigrant narrative, it's a Black American narrative. And it's time to remind ourselves and Jared Kushner and anyone else of that everybody here, <laughs> you know, meaning all groups, want the best for themselves and their kids. They want great opportunities. Nobody wants to, to be left behind or want their kids to be left behind. It's the differences, opportunity, right? My generation, had a, a lots of opportunity. We're one of the you know first generations of kids who went to integrated schools. We are the you know the generation, or at least part of that generation, where affirmative action into elite schools, or at least concerns about the diversity of elite at least elite schools. My brother went to Phillips Academy. Um, you know, I went to Baltimore Public Schools, so uh -huh. <laughs> we still ended up at Brown together, right? But that's opportunity. Right. And then when you get there, you make the most of it, but you have to give people access. Right. And it's the opportunity hoarding by, you know, arranged by wealth, right, by caste, which is the tradition of this country and almost every other country. That is what limits what people can achieve, not their talent, not their desire and not their their willingness to work hard. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. do, your, do your results differ by region? Blue state, red state, coast versus Midwest, city versus urban? Yeah, great question. So um, yes and no. So the yes, I'll do the no. The no, everybody overestimates. I mean, everybody. <laughs> Again, Black people do it, white people do it, Latinos do it, Asian, everybody does it, okay? Interestingly though, um, it's, it's the overestimates, especially among wealthier white Americans are worse in places where there's more inequality, right? Because it's hard to believe. Well, where is there more inequality? Connecticut, New York, Boston, <laughs> Chicago. So actually blue state folks on average do a little worse um, on this than uh, folks, red state folks on average. Of course, it's all canceled out by how much you believe in belief in a just world. I mean, you know, there's there are lots of variables, but where there is more inequality, um, there's more motivation to deny it. Okay. <laughs> we often see that perceptions are created for self-preservation. Given the observations you shared, is it fair to say that desegregation is needed for a shared experience that will shatter any myth? Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, I think it's uh, it's needed for any number of reasons, um, including to break down uh, stereotypes and this. Um, but but I think the the that point about shared experiences 
um, is so important, and it's not just across racial lines, it's across any number of other divides, um, that when that falls apart, it's easier for us to, you know, fall into the traps of using stereotypes or just believing that people are fine and happy in their current circumstances or for just closing ourselves off to the inequality, right? Not going in those places where those people live. Okay. Here's a question about the presentation. Was, um, was I reading your chart correctly, that wealthier Black folks have a less accurate estimation of the mythology of racial progress than do poor whites? Uh, not significantly different, no. <laughs> yeah, Okay. They're about the same. But definitely worse than poor uh, Black Americans, meaning less accurate. <laughs> Don't you think that many people may not really care? Why would the ones who benefit from income inequity want to change something that benefits their families, i.e. college admission? Yeah, no, there are certainly people who don't care um, as individuals. There are fewer um, people <laughs> um, who don't care at sort of when you overlay it as Americans and as citizens of a nation that says it is concerned with equal opportunity, equal protection of the law, that really um, has made the claim that where you're born is your zip code, characteristics of birth, race, you know, should not be so predictive of your outcomes you know, when there's evidence that they that these things do predict and predict strongly, then it's time for us to be really concerned because we have um, violated our founding principles, grossly violated them. Thank you. Do you find a greater wealth gap in the South between whites and blacks? So we haven't looked at that um, in our work, um, it would be it would be great to look at. I I I don't know, I, I don't know um, uh, with wealth in particular. It's not true with income. Income inequality is more prevalent in the in the cities, um, in the big cities. In part because people make so much money <laughs> on the high end, right? The low end is a, is about the same. A lot of places, the high end is very different in New York and LA and Boston than in um, a lot of uh, southern cities. Thank you. Okay, are there any benefits of living in ethnically segregated neighborhoods? Given the value of some ethnic enclaves, are there buffers or protective health effects for Blacks living in predominantly Black neighborhoods? That's a great question. Um, so, you know, of course, any, anywhere, <laughs> that's, that's hard to answer. Um, so I won't, I'll dodge. <laughs> and whether that could ever be true is, is even less answerable, right? I mean, certainly, um, you know, for half of her life, my mother grew up in, in, the, in Durham in a segregated space. Um, and there were certainly some protective value to that, um, you know, for sure. Uh, and, and decidedly had a different experience when her family moved to Baltimore and she was immediately um, integrated into a school, well, plopped into white schools because there was no integration. It was just a few black kids plopped into white schools and had to deal with that all that harassment. That is still part of who she is and that those sores are still there. Um, so in many ways, her life in Durham was much better than her life in Baltimore. Um, but we do know that, um, again, on average, having you know diverse, especially schools, which also means neighborhoods um, usually, uh, then, allows for for the pooling of resources and that is what brings everybody up in terms of quality um, educational opportunities outcomes um, investment public goods right all of that um, that makes for a peaceful and sound neighborhood um, increase compared to the divestment of all of those things and that often happens in uh, disproportionately minority and poor um, neighborhoods. So for the most part, no, there is a beautiful, um, you know, 
Prince George's County, Maryland, which is disproportionately black and relatively middle class. And it has some, there are some interesting results from that county. And there's been a lot of research on it that suggests that that actually has been protective in some ways compared to black kids in other middle class suburbs um, who are surrounded by, by white kids. Okay, um, we're almost near the end. How do we, as nearby towns to Bridgeport, connect our kids to those schools? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm not sure I'm the one to, to, yeah. to answer it. Um, yeah, you know, but I, I think uh, maybe the, the, the answer is, you know, not just in that, that specific case, but in general, um, you know, broadening, we all can and certainly should consider broadening our what's sort of called kind of area or scope of moral concern, right? We tend to immediately, of course, think about our, ourselves, but our family, our kids, our neighborhoods, the schools that our kids go to, the clubs, right? Broadly, broaden it, right? Broaden it to communities that aren't your own. Broaden it to, um, you know, states, neighborhoods, right? All these things. And that then makes you invested in it, right? And its well-being. And that is one way to commit to change. Thank you. And the very last question, I know um, we're at the end. What do you envision your next work to be? Well, I mean, will you continue along this line? Obviously it's fascinating, but can you share with us anything special that you think you might be working on? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm still obviously working on this, but expanding yeah. out the argument of this mythology to other, um, you know, pieces of it. So I've done a lot of work, which was referenced, um, you know, earlier about um, how we believe that, you know, more diversity will naturally lead to more tolerance. That's not quite true. It's harder than that. So I've done a lot of research trying to help people think about interracial interactions and contact and, and to overcome the concern and stress that they uh, often uh, engender. Um, but I, um, I, I'm mostly right now uh, concerned about this insofar as, you know, we just have a, a new uh, Supreme Court justice installed. Um, there's no uh, evidence that she, um, like the last two or last three <laughs> that were installed um, are supportive of uh, federal or even sometimes local interventions to uh, usher in a more progressive racial justice agenda, including voluntary um, uh, school integ uh, integration efforts or desegregation efforts, right? Those have, Roberts has struck that down. Um, so I'm concerned about that, right? I'm concerned about um, how do we, those of us who believe that this is fundamental to our nation um, and to its success and to its ideals, how do we um, how do we understand that and understand um, what to say in this moment um, and how to yeah, how to think about it and how to frame this, these questions in a way that are productive and bring us together and really do help us become the multiracial, multi-ethnic, um, interfaith uh, nation that's pluralistic, but also um, democratic. How do, we, how do we become that ideal? Okay. <laughs> well, our time is up, unfortunately. We could go on forever and ever, but um, I wanna thank you. We're getting very positive feedback from our audience. Thank you're you. so gracious and you know, we're wonderful. We're so excited that you spent this time with us. Thank you. So, thank you. Good night. Come to New Haven. <laughs> when it's safe again. <laughs> we, we shall. Okay. Thanks so much. Good night. Good night.